अजून चालू व्हायचंय का started soon
BD Tilak Memorial Lecture. Uh, the tradition has been that this lecture is a little, you know, different than the kind of lectures that we normally have uh, at NCL. There are little Hatke lectures. They're little uh, away from the kind of uh, uh, research that we do and the kind of uh, technology programs that we uh, uh, that that we uh, do at NCL. So it is in that tradition that we have the the lecture today. Uh, before we begin the talk, uh, uh, I just want to, uh, for those of you who may not have heard too much about uh, Professor B.D. Tilak, I just want to give you a, a brief introduction to him and what he did and why we are honoring him today in this uh, uh, memorial lecture. So Professor B.D. Tilak uh, was the NCL's uh, fourth director uh, from 1968 to 1979. He was also the second Indian director of NCL. Before him, his uh, his uh, uh, mentor, Professor K. V. As we call him, K. K. Venkatraman, was the director of, of NCL. So he actually hired B. D. Tilak, uh, and for the only time ever in NCL's history, uh, he was hired as the additional director of, of of NCL. It was given that after K. V. retired, uh, B. D. would. Uh, uh, take over, and that is basically what happened. Uh, Bidi Tilak was uh, a renowned uh, expert in the dye stuff and fine chemicals uh, industry. He played a, a pioneering role in setting up this particular industry sector uh, in India. And if you go back and look at NCL's, uh, could you please turn your mobile phones off? Uh, so if you go back and look at NCL's history, uh, you will find that. Uh, a very large number of technologies uh, were developed, were licensed uh, during this time period of mid 60s to late 70s. And, and much of that was done uh, by the uh, sheer dedication, the passion uh, of uh, Professor B.D. Tilak. So uh, Professor Tilak was uh, born in Pune in 1918. Uh, he graduated with chemistry degree in uh, from SP College in 1933. Then he went to what is uh, the erstwhile UDCT, now the ICT, and actually got a degree in textile chemistry uh, in 1939. Went on to do his PhD from the same department in 1943. Uh, and then he had a couple of degrees, DPhil and DSC later on. Uh, went for a postdoc at Harvard and worked with two Nobel laureates. Okay. Uh, Sir Robert Robinson, who happened to be at NCL at uh, the first time the lab was open to the nation. Uh, Sir Robert Robinson was part of that very uh, luminous crowd here. Uh, and also Professor uh, Woodward, with whom he did his postdoc. Uh, so, uh, as I said, B.D. Tilak was instrumental in sort of uh, uh, initiating the dye stuff industry and, and instrumental in, in growing it. Uh, and uh, he was... Uh, the chairman of uh, Hindustan Organic Chemicals, a huge company at that time, and two other very large chemical companies, only one of which survives today, Amar Daikem. Uh, so he was uh, uh, the chairman and the board of director of both those companies. It's it's uh, unbelievable to, to even think about it, that an NCL director will become the board of uh, directors, the chairman of, of a, a private sector company. But these things used to happen in the past. Uh, Viditilak was a very interesting uh, character, uh, and I know a few people who uh, knew him very well, worked with him very closely. And, and there is this one incident that uh, I have heard a couple of times in the past. I don't know how many of you have heard, but it sort of epitomizes uh, uh, B.D. Tilak's uh, uh, character. You know, he uh, at that time uh, HOC was looking for a for a licensing a technology for acetamylide, a very key intermediate in the, in the dye stuff and fine chemical industry. And, and they came out with a tender. You know, they had a press release for a tender. And they were obviously looking to license the technology from uh, big giants like Bayer and, and Union Carbide and so on. Uh, B.D. Tilak, who was the additional director of NCL at that time, decided that NCL must bid for that tender. Okay. So he went and convinced the director that we will bid for this for this global tender. Okay. Uh, he put together a group of, you know, we, we think that we should do it today. He put together a group of chemists, catalysis people, chemical engineers to work on this technology. 
and uh, they worked around the clock and in a uh, crack time with this crack team they came out with a complete uh, basic engineering and a detailed engineering package even at that time he had the vision of getting a process engineering company uh, called you know dalal at uh, that time rd dalal uh, he brought them on board and together ncl and uh, uh, rl dalal put together this this plant uh, i mean this this technology and they went to a, they went to hoc they, they bid for the tender hoc didn't want as usual an indian uh, company uh, lab to have you know to get a license from an indian lab didn't believe it so uh, but they couldn't deny it because it was an open tender so ncl bid for it and they had to accept it uh, and then when the tender opened uh, they uh, found many reasons why the tender cannot be considered valid so they gave a long list of reasons uh, all technical that these are the reasons why you know you cannot consider your bid so pd uh, clerk said i am going to fight this out and he put together a massive document uh, and uh, i have actually seen that document so massive document that he put together countering every single technical point that was raised in that objection and then he went to kv the director and uh, showed him the response <laughs> and kv was aghast because there was one line in that response saying this is a lie okay, i mean the, the the they had raised an objection and he wrote down that this is a lie So KV told him, you know, this is not parliamentary language. You cannot use that language. You know, tone it down. So he said, okay, I'll tone it down. He went back, uh, he rewrote it, and then submitted it back to the director. And KV was aghast even more because it said, this is a damn lie. <laughs> <laughs> that was B D T L. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and and he NCL won the bid. NCL put together a plant. and it ran for 20 years uh, it made a lot of money for hoc they ironed out all the you know teething problems that the plant came out and this was the first successful commercial licensing of a full end to end technology from ncl so this is bd tr okay and then he uh, uh, developed multiple such processes uh, many of them licensed in fact uh, magesh showed me in one of the annual reports in the 1975 uh, there was a map of india and that showed Uh, how many ncl technologies are running across the country and there were uh, something like 100 plus technologies that were that were not showed on the map uh, so this is very interesting to see what uh, ncl was doing at that point of time uh, and it is something that we uh, still uh, aspire to do uh, e- e- even today so um, you know I, i i'm not going to say much about it but i want to point out you know why we are meeting today with this sort of special lecture uh, because pd uh, clark had a second innings in fact at the end of his uh, tenure as director uh, he completely shifted his thinking and uh, thought about what ncl should do for that last phrase in our motto that is enshrined in our fire you now we do what we do for the good of the people that is what is shrine, uh, written there right and he said we are not doing enough for the good of the people so he completely moved actually to rural development and in the last uh, annual report of of reliance uh, of uh, ncl uh, there is a whole chapter on what ncl should be doing for developing technologies that are more appropriate for for rural development uh, and i don't think that kind of thing has been written again uh, he also created uh, uh, i think what is called uh, uh, made a few notes uh, center for application of science and technology for rural development in fact i have been to that it doesn't exist now it uh, i have been to that office there's only one time when i picked up dr bd tilak and brought him to ncl he was quite old at that time but uh, this this center existed and when he uh, stepped down from the directorship of ncl he went and worked in that center for the good remaining part of his life uh, he actually created uh, for chandrapur district an entire uh, planning document for how science and technology interventions could be used for uh, uplifting the uh, adivasis in the chandrapur district okay so uh, he sort of devoted himself to rural development 
and the use of science and technology, appropriate technologies for uh, rural development. So quite a quite a character. And I thought that uh, for somebody like him, uh, we should have uh, a speaker who uh, can tell us a lot of things that we don't know. Uh, so today's speaker is going to talk about, and I'm going to leave the introductions to, to Sarika, but uh, this is a huge pressing problem for, for all of us, which is climate change. Right? And uh, we look at, as, as chemists and chemical engineers, we look at climate change from a uh, purely science and technology perspective, uh, but there's different angles to it. And I think one of those uh, different dimension of looking at that problem is, is hopefully something that we are going to learn from, uh, from, from Sharad. So this talk is a little open. Uh, he will, of course, pitch it at a level that you and I can understand. Uh, so it will be simpler. Uh, but uh, there's a question answer session at the end of it. And I hope that we have some lively discussions after the talk. So with that, uh, I'm going to leave the floor to Sarika to introduce the speaker. Thank you, Ashish. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Sharad Chandra Lele. Um, he, as you can read from in the flyer, his bio, his bio data says he received a BTEC in electrical engineering from IIT Mumbai, a MS from ISC Bangalore, but working on something very different, which is environmental impacts of large dams, and a PhD in energy and resources from UC Berkeley on sustainable forest use in the Western Ghats here, not some, something in the US. Now, uh, he describes himself as an interdisciplinary environmental researcher, bridging the natural sciences, economics, political science to understand the concepts and pathways to be environmentally sustainable and develop society. And he works on sustainable forest management. He works on forest governance, forest hydrology, and there's a long list there what he works on. He has published in a range of interdisciplinary environmental journals and in several books, including Rethinking Environmentalism, Thinking Justice, Sustainability and Diversity, and Democrat Democratizing Forest Governance. Uh, what I would what is not written here and uh, I would like to share with you is something why he made this change. You know, you can see that he has changed from being an electrical engineer to uh, to an MS in ecological sciences and then to policy, right? So he believed while he was doing it, he shared this with us uh, sometime like an hour ago, that while he was an electrical engineer, like studying as an electrical engineer, he thought, what am I doing for the country, you know? Most of his classmates probably were going to the Bay Area and earning a lot of money, which he could have earned too. But he really wanted to do something for the country. And that's the reason he uh, met Professor Gardgill, who had just started the uh, ecological science uh, department, or didn't even start it, like was about to start it in uh, IIS Bangalore. So he went there for an MS. And, uh, and he's also, uh, he, is, he loves nature. And he loves bird watching and other things. So that probably drew him to ecological science. And from there, he also went ahead and went into policy. So he thought that probably will be able, he will be able to contribute the most to the country. So we will hear more from him. And um, with that, I would like to invite Sharad to speak on forests and climate action in India, science, social science, and ethics, all in all, all in one. Hear my voice? My audible? Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be in National Chemical Laboratory in Pune and a special privilege to be asked to give the Mediterranean Memorial Lecture. Um, I'm happy to say again, it's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here to give the immediate memorial lecture. And I was doubly happy to hear the uh, background that uh, Ashish gave of the own journey. I was kind of feeling a little, uh, what shall I say, uh, worried that I was speaking in, a, in an institute and in the memory of somebody who was a hardcore chemical technology person. 
but the kind of journey that you described, particularly towards the end of him moving towards questions of rural development. So I think this is a journey that many of us have taken or many of us are trying to take. And I was just lucky, the point that Sarika mentioned, I was just lucky that I maybe had a few flashbulb moments uh, early on as to where my passion lay and where I thought I would be most uh, useful socially. Um, and I was lucky also in terms of getting the right guidance at the right time, starting with Vijay Paranspe here, uh, who's an environment economist based in Pune. Uh, Professor Madhav Gadgir was also a Pune girl actually, but was based in Bangalore. And during my PhD days, again, being challenged repeatedly by social scientists to shift my thinking from my engineering roots, then my techno engineering or techno economic way of thinking through the lens of economics uh, to a much more socialized understanding of environmental problems. And I'm going to try to share a little bit of that with you today with apologies in terms of time and the complexity of the issue. Uh, but I'm also really glad that. Uh, NCAL uh, has this lecture series in the memory of Dr. B. Dieter and uh, is also thinking in, as you said, Hatke ways, looking at the future, looking at the question of how how is the work that all science or technology research institutes in the country, especially those, those that are publicly funded, uh, should be thinking about societal problems. And I think that that shifted motto that you mentioned because I read in your wider description of NCL that the mission is to produce uh, science in, uh, you know, to uh, increase the wealth of society. And I think you need to re rethink that motto because it's not pursuit of wealth really that we should be thinking about, especially in the modern context of uh, the environmental crisis, the social crisis that we are all in the midst of. So uh, maybe through this lecture, we can start that conversation in, in some ways. Um, you will also notice that old habits die hard. So as children, we are taught the division between science, arts, commerce. And science by definition means natural and physical science. And then social science is sitting somewhere in arts. So BA economics, BA sociology, BA political science. Uh, if you're not a good, good, good enough student to get the engineering, then you do science. And if you're not good enough to do even that, then you know, uh, maybe you go to BCom if you're smart enough, otherwise you uh, do BA. This has been the thinking that we have been socializing. And you will see that habit has died dying hard because I should have really said natural science, social science, uh, and ethics. Uh, that is how I'm going to present the topic. Uh, so in October 2015, when India presented its uh, uh, nationally determined commitments uh, and submitted them to the uh, conference that was coming up in Paris in December on the question of climate change, right? Um, even a relatively uh, radical group such as uh, Center for Science and Environment, uh, Sonita Narayan, who's been fairly critical of uh, government policy, said India's in INDC is fair uh, and its renewable energy and forestry targets are ambitious. Uh, so this sort of said, okay, we have really done, we are pushing the envelope in terms of the kinds of commitments that a country in the global south can make, including or especially in the forest sector. Now, when we look at it another uh, five, seven uh, years later, uh, we start uh, seeing, actually right right from then, people started questioning whether the commitments that were being made in the forestry sector in particular were uh, sensible. Uh, and Kanti, Goli, and Manju Menon talked about growing forests in the air. And more recently, in 2021, uh, Nitin Tedi writes about how the UN itself has questioned India's forest cover data for lack of transparency and health. So, the kind of uh, claim, the commitments we have made and the kind of uh, claims that we are making in terms of meeting those commitments have a certain question mark against them. Uh, and finally, we have this article which says, from the same down to earth, India unlikely to meet carbon sink uh, commitments. So uh, we sort of come back to full circle to the problem that maybe we uh, should have been a little smarter in making those commitments. But I think there's a larger question here, which we need to try to understand not just what is going on in terms of the numbers. So, okay, so should we have committed to 2.5, uh, you know, billion tons or should we have maybe committed to two or 1.5? If it, if it was that simple, uh, you know, then it would be a kind of a numbers uh, discussion that would be, you know, happening here. But how do we really see the question of forests in the context of climate change? I think this is really what uh, we need to think about. And there's a natural science dimension to it, of course, uh, which is what is forest carbon sequestration? and how much is possible under what conditions. So in a sense, when, under what conditions or under what assumptions is this number that India has committed to 
you know, become realistic? And what are the ecological consequences of doing a forestry which is focused on carbon sequestration? That is obviously the other question that natural science can and should illuminate. Uh, on the social science side, the question is what are the social assumptions that are inbuilt in some of these numbers of these estimates of these commitments that we're making in the international arena? And what are the social consequences of uh, making such commitments and then trying to deliver single-mindedly on the carbon target. And mind you, I'm not making a distinction really between ecological consequences and social consequences. One of my uh, attempts in this lecture is to actually convey that the ecological is social because it's when we say something is an ecological consequence, it is a consequence that we care about because as a community, as a society, we care about that particular form or that particular uh, you know pathway through which we are in. Uh, and therefore, the question of not just what are those consequences, but who's facing which consequences and who's facing the benefits or getting the benefits of this sequestration effort. And that leads us then to the ethics of uh, forest carbon, which is should we at all prioritize forests uh, for their carbon sink function? And how do we make those decisions? Whether to prioritize or whether to prioritize under what conditions, what commitments to make and so on and so forth. How have we made that decision? How should we make, be making those decisions about what to do in our forests. Um, and that's kind of where I would like to end up in this talk. So let's start with the carbon cycle. Uh, I think all of you at some point, those who have read about the climate change problem will have seen some diagram like this. And the, the point about the important point is on the left hand side of this figure, where we are looking at terrestrial vegetation. And we are saying that 121.3, uh, uh, in this case, I think it is petagrams of carbon is being uh, sequestered of which 60 is going back as respiration and 60 is going back as decay of dead matter that enters the soil as later fall and then goes back as decay. And 1.6 is actually coming out uh, or going back to the atmosphere in the form of burning of, uh, say, firewood or burning of the forest itself and so on. So uh, that's the rough picture. And that immediately alerts us to the fact that forests sequester carbon only under certain circumstances. If you want to actually reduce the amount of atmospheric carbon and suck it into forests, then it will have to be done under very particular uh, uh, conditions. So the first point to note is that individual trees do not sequester any net carbon dioxide over their lifetime. Because whatever they sequester through photosynthesis, first one part is lost, lost immediately through respiration. The remaining is your net primary production, which is sequestered in the tree in the form of photosynthase. And that is eventually lost when the tree dies and decays. And even during the lifetime of the tree, when the leaves fall, when the twigs fall, when the branches fall, uh, those that, that part of the photosynthate is essentially uh, then decaying at, in the soil uh, and going back as, as uh, CO2. So, and then finally, the tree itself falls and decays. So over the life, complete lifetime of the tree, really no net sequestration is happening. And the flip side of this is that in the complete lifetime of the tree, no net production of oxygen is happening either. And for all my environmentalist friends in the audience, this is something for us to keep in mind that trees are not net producers of oxygen, no matter what kind of pseudoscience and uh, badly informed science or environmental, maybe shall we say, hopes that we may have. We should not be selling either tree planting or forests in the name of oxygen production. They do play an important role in the carbon cycle, and we'll come to that in a second, but not in the context of oxygen. Um, so, why individual trees do not sequester carbon or net sequester any carbon over their lifetime, a standing forest will actually hold a net amount equal to its standing stock. If you take a snapshot of a forest, there is a certain amount of carbon that is sitting there as that uh, standing biomass. On the assumption, of course, that the standing forest will continue to stand even if individual trees die. So the, the forest has its own renewal mechanism, which is younger trees then grow, grow into older trees. And as long as that mechanism is intact, as long as that uh, uh, forest is not actually being deforested, for instance, and the growth rates remain as before, uh, replenishment is happening, you will see that the standing forest does in fact sequester a certain amount of carbon dioxide while individual trees go through their life and death cycle. A plantation or a growing natural forest uh, will actually pull in uh, more carbon dioxide. 
Whereas a standing forest which has reached climax actually is not pulling in any net amount of carbon dioxide beyond what is already there because it's, it's reached climax. Uh, a growing natural forest or a newly planted uh, plantation will pull in more, for it, uh, more carbon dioxide at the rate of mean annual increment, which is the change in standing stock over time or let's say annual change in standing stock in this case, right? Again, your assumption that this will lead to a net sequestration in the long run depends upon the fact that or idea that it will stand there permanently. So if the tree grows for 15 years from scratch or the plantation grows for 15 years from scratch and then is cut down and burnt, then at the end of it, you have not really achieved any net sequestration. You have temporarily sequestered carbon dioxide for about 15 years uh, and then it is lost again. So it, it is an assumption that the plantation will grow from scratch. So you had a barren piece of land and then you planted trees and the trees grew uh, during that period it added carbon dioxide so it subtracted that from the atmospheric carbon and then somehow you magically enabled that plantation to continue to be there and if you didn't then you will have to replant and in which case the standing stock will go up and then come to zero and will go up and come to zero as you cut so the average standing stock will be only half assuming some kind of a linear growth and all that it will be something roughly half of the peak standing stock of that of that plantation, right? Um, in both cases, it is important to remember even your plantation is eventually going to stop sequestering any additional carbon because it will kind of taper off and reach a steady state where it is doing a lot of photosynthesis, but all that photosynthesis is gone in respiration and then in later fall and death. So it's it's equalized in, uh, through that mechanism, right? Uh, so this is this is the science background through which we can then look at a particular commitment that we have made. So what is India's nationally determined com uh, commitment number three uh, in Paris? To create an additional carbon sink of two and a half to three billion tons of CO2 equivalent through additional forest and tree cover by 2030. So this is, mind you, in 2015 that we made the commitment, which means in 15 years we would do this kind of a additional uh, carbon to be sucked out of the atmosphere and permanently stored in India's forests. That permanently stored uh, dimension is really important because if we just did it over 15 years and then let it go, then you've not really contributed anything to solving the climate change problem. And the means through which or the numbers that they had portrayed as to how this was going to be done is increase forest cover to the extent of 5 million hectares and improve the quality of forest or tree cover in another 5 million hectares of forest. Uh, so that's sort of roughly the two mechanisms. You have some standing forest, you're going to improve 5 million hectares of that standing forest, and you don't have forest in 5 million hectares, which you're going to somehow plant or regenerate or uh, re, uh, re forest uh, and, and, and sequester a certain uh, part of this 2.5 billion or 3 billion tons that you have committed to. So the question is, is this realistic in a physical sense? So if you just look at those numbers, and I'm going to take the three just for the ease of the math, three gigatons in uh, uh, 15 years, that's 200 per year over 25 years, if you sort of take a linear average, you know, uh, pathway. Uh, and if you say, okay, there are two, two pathways, you're saying one is new forest and one is improvement in uh, existing forest. And let's divide the target half-half into those because in fact, as you will see, it becomes harder if you do it in any other way. So uh, half comes from, comes from afforestation of 5 million hectares. That means you have to sequester at the rate of 20 tons of CO2 per hectare per year. Yeah, just do the math. Um, uh, now, if you look at the empirical data on the rate at which trees and plantations and natural forests sequester uh, carbon dioxide, fast growing plantations, their net sequestration rate ranges somewhere between three to eight tons of CO2 per hectare per year. And they will start, I've put that for 15 years because they will start tapering off after that initially uh, fast growing period. Um, natural forest, which is at a secondary succession stage and not uh, reached climax, will add some uh, CO2 over its lifetime. But those net sequestration rates are going to be much lower. They're going to be up to 1.5 tons of CO2 per hectare per year. So this is the kind of realistic estimate that you might have. So if you were doing the improvement of natural forest, you're actually going to get only 0.5 to 1.5. If you're doing fresh plantations and fast growing species, mind you, which are going to be mostly exotics, and if you want to really do sequestration fast, it's going to be only one kind of species or, you know, eucalyptus or casuarina or, uh, you know, all our uh, forest department's favorites. Um, uh, then you will get these higher rates, but even 3 to 8 is nowhere near 20. 
and certainly 0.5 to 1.5, which would be the other half that you had promised, is again nowhere near 20. And if you bring the 20 down for the improved improvement of existing forest, then you'll have to raise the 20 to 25 or 30 for the newly planted forest. So then that target goes even further away. So that's that's really the bottom line. That even from a purely ecologically Whatever ecological science tells us about the growth rates of trees, plantations, even exotic species, and our natural forests, these numbers are simply impossible to achieve. You cannot achieve this target. That's the uh, first message. But even in this comparison between fast growing plantations of eucalyptus or casuarina and natural forests, there is a hidden message already in there, which is that we worry about trade offs. Because the moment I compare these two, which means that are, these are different forests. But they are, they are different not just because of their growth rate, because if I was only looking at CO2, then I should go for fast-growing plantations. Why am I even considering this slow-growing behemoth or elephant called natural forest? I should just forget about it. But this comparison itself tells you that there's a hidden concern about trade-offs, and that's what I'm going to come to next, which is that our typical silvicultural strategies for CO2, and in the past for pulpwood, or in the past for timber, or in the past for any kind of production forestry, have been... Acacia auriculiformis, uh, pine, eucalyptus, right? So basically, monocultures of exotics, or in the case of pine, not exotics, but species which are not necessarily suitable for that particular region, but forced to be planted anyway. I, I have uh, in working right now in Chhattisgarh in Bastar district, and in the middle of Bastar district, which is uh, dry desert or moist deciduous tropical uh, forest you have a pine plantation created by the forest department because it thought somehow you could do <laughs> pine uh, production in that area. So that's been our strategy in the past, and that is likely going to be your strategy in the future, especially if you're running after this target of two and a half or three uh, you know, <coughs> gigatons of CO2 that we are committed to sequester. But India's forests are much more complicated. They are a very complicated socio-ecological entity, not just an ecological entity. Mm -hmm. Of course, they harbor wildlife, biodiversity, plant biodiversity. They are a source of uh, rivers in the sense, and I want to really use the wording carefully. All rivers in India originate in forested regions. The river itself does not flow because of the forest, but the forest does provide very important regulatory functions of the hydrological regime. The rain will fall regardless of whether the forest is there or not, but the timing of the water release and therefore the summer month water in particular, the base flows in the river will be determined or influenced by the presence or absence of forests in the watershed. Uh, and of course, the soil conservation function. But forests are also very important in our country. Historically, for thousands of years, people have been living in and around forests and using forests for firewood, for grazing of cattle. As you know, India has the largest livestock population in the world. Uh, for feeding the cattle, even if they don't graze themselves, you bring grass from the forest. Uh, and for the collection of non-timber forest products like Siari Patta in Odisha or Tindu Patta in Madhya Pradesh, which is used for making BDs, uh, and providing enormous amount of livelihood support for forest dwelling communities across central India in particular, but also in the northeast, also in the Himalayas, western Ghats, southern India, and so on. So uh, forests are not just these lovely so, you know, ecological entities that urbanites like me can visit once in a uh, you know, blue moon and kind of do bird watching and enjoy the coolness of the forest and then come back in a car and get back into my usual carbon emitting activities in the city. But actually, they are historically important sources of livelihood, well being, and culture for communities who have been in that area for a millennia. And I don't mean to fossilize or in any way kind of portray these communities as unchanging and kind of backward and so on and so forth. Quite the contrary, these communities are also very well plugged into what's going on around them, but they are still attached economically and culturally to their forests and drawing sustenance in, in material and non-material terms. We also have, of course, the industrial uh, dimension of forestry, which is whether it's bamboo production or whether it's timber production that, uh, you know, historically uh, was the legacy of colonial forestry continued after 1947 also for a long time and even today. In fact, I had photographs from, from uh, Chhattisgarh, which I have taken out, but of uh, basically trees being felled under the so-called cook felling system of the forest department, even while we are talking about carbon sequestration targets, um, you know, for the government of India. 
So you can think of forests uh, having five broad stakes and stakeholders which are different. So biodiversity can be seen as a stake for local communities, for regional, national or global stakeholders. Watershed service is really something that forests provide in, in the basin. So it's the downstream communities that benefit from the watershed regulation that happens upstream. Um, firewood grazing, non-timber forest products, something that benefits local communities which are within walking distance of the forest. It's very rarely that somebody will take a truck and drive 50 kilometers to go and collect non-timber forest products, although it happens for the, some of the more valuable ones. Um, and timber, of course, there is timber and softwood that are feeding the regional economy uh, of the country. So if you think, and finally, the new stake in forests, which is carbon, which is the carbon sequestration capacity of forests. And that's kind of a new thing that has emerged in the market. 1972, when we had the first uh, United Nations uh, conference on the human environment, climate change was not really mentioned. In the uh, range of environmental problems that were discussed, we had wildlife, we had pollution, we had uh, running out of resources. We didn't really talk about climate change. In the last 50 years, we are now in the uh, Stockholm plus 50 year, uh, climate change has become really a globally talked about and really serious uh, problem. So the, the stake in forest now of the carbon that is sequestered. The key point here is that trade-offs are inevitable. And I just gave you the example between uh, uh, eucalyptus plantations and natural forests. And that's really the uh, a very easy way of, of illustrating the trade-off which is the trade-off between focusing on carbon goals alone, um, which is also have going to have multidimensional impacts because there are these four other stakes that you have to worry about and you cannot uh, maximize or, in, or provide adequate uh, benefits on those four dimensions if you focus on maximizing the carbon dimension. A simple example, of course, is if you're interested in firewood, you cannot cut firewood in a carbon forest. Because then what's the point in having the carbon forest? It will not be sequestering carbon anymore. So carbon forests become off limits for local communities. That's the first and immediate consequence. So the fence and put guns in guards uh, policy of the forest department, which has continued from the colonial period, it began as fencing forests for their timber value. Then it switched or continues in parallel for fencing forests for their conservation value, which is their biodiversity value. And now you will make them into fenced forests, uh, policed by armed guards, for their carbon value. And in the in this whole thinking, the local community in particular will be left out. But the carbon-oriented forestry will also have implications for biodiversity, for hydrology. So I live in Bangalore, and as many of you probably know, in the vicinity of Bangalore, we have had the proliferation of eucalyptus plantations. And so we actually did a study of the Arkavati River Basin, uh, where we looked at the impact of land use change in the Arkavati Basin on the flow of the river. And the true two major drivers of the drying up of the Arkavati. Today, the Arkavati does not really flow at all. And the two reasons why it does not flow, number one is the planting of eucalyptus, which went from zero to 20% of the catchment of the Arkavati in the, in the period between 1972 and 2012. So 20% of the land is covered by eucalyptus plantations, and all of them are almost all of them are pri private plantations. So this is farm forestry being done for selling uh, eucalyptus to the pulp industry, and to the construction industry. And the second uh, major reason, of course, is the pumping of groundwater actively through bore wells for cultivating vegetables and fruit crops and so on and so forth. So eucalyptus is really dangerous for all fast growing species because they grow very fast, which means they have high transpiration rates, which means they will have high consequences for water in a country where we already have a lot of water scarcity and conflict over the remaining water. Alternatively, if we said, okay, fine, you know, Forest, uh, forests are not important only for carbon. Let's do a multi-dimensional kind of thinking or multi-objective planning um, and do mixed forestry using natural species, uh, do natural regeneration methods rather than focusing on just planting and so on and so forth. You're going to have lower rates of carbon sequestration. It is not that you will not have any carbon sequestration, but you will have to factor in what is the silviculture practice, not only of planting, not only of growing, but also of utilizing. Because for every amount that you extract, you lose that much of the carbon sequestration benefit. In the exceptional case where you extract for the sake of maybe putting it in furniture and then hope to lock up that furniture using varnish or paint or something from decay for the next 50 years, you've kind of delayed the <coughs> decay, decay part of the cycle for about 50 years. 
it is an thing going to decay, but you could argue that, well, if we do some kind of thought experiment and convert everything in this room, which is metal or plastic or whatever, into wood, then somehow we have kind of locked away an addition of so many gigatons in, in, but the costs of doing that, apart from the social consequences themselves, are still very high. And we need to really think about it. So it is not about not doing carbon forestry. <clears throat> Just talking about using realistic numbers. And it is about looking at the multiple dimensions of impact and therefore about the trade-offs and therefore deciding what's the better balance in what context. Right? Um, so we come to the last bit of my lecture, which is who decides on these trade-offs? Let's say we do a very fancy, sophisticated analysis where we look at five different forms of silviculture and we one is firewood oriented forestry, one is timber oriented forestry, one is you know, more grazing oriented forestry, each of them will have some carbon benefit. And of course, that will depend on your baseline. <clears throat> if you're, you're starting from a barren piece of land, you could claim more carbon credits, but the rate, rates of growth will be much slower than if you have a relatively good piece of land where there's already some rootstock and the trees are going to regenerate really, really fast. So your baseline will determine what are the rates of sequestration you get, whereas your social scenario will determine how that forest is used and therefore how much is used up and lost again as firewood or for grazing and so on and so forth. And if you want to have grazing in the forest, you will reduce your tree density so that the grass will actually grow in the understory and you will not end up with a closed canopy that wipes out all grass products. Right? So the question is not just now doing the ecological analysis for different silvicultural options, not just the economic analysis and comparing what is the, what is the price of carbon in the carbon uh, credit market, but also the question of who decides, who decides what kind of forestry to do where. So traditionally, as an engineer, I was taught that these decisions are to be done through benefit cost analysis. If you move from the private domain, then it is done through a financial profit and loss analysis. If you move to a public policy domain, you should be doing an economic benefit cost analysis. You can factor in all your environmental consequences through extended environmental benefit cost analysis. And that's the, whatever comes out of that analysis, that is the final answer. The greater good, good of the greatest number. Because that's the principle behind benefit cost uh, calculations, which is effectively a one rupee, one vote decision making process. And therefore, if you're a poor person who can only afford to pay 20 rupees a kilo for firewood, because that's all you can afford, then your loss of firewood will be counted at 20 rupees, whereas the 50 rupees going to a rich person for timber or furniture will be counted as a, you know, a net gain in the whole process. And so you'll move from a firewood oriented forestry towards a furniture oriented forestry or for there, from there to a biodiversity oriented forestry because somebody was willing to pay 20,000 rupees to come on a safari to that forest to watch the tiger, but not pay, obviously the poor person is not going to pay that kind of an amount. So the traditional analysis of approach of benefit cost analysis is flawed because of its one rupee, one vote principle. And a more ethical approach then is of democratic governance. And I don't mean democratic governance only in the sense we understand it today in our country, which is people who vote once in five years to elect some people at the state and central government, and then they supposedly decide on our behalf, but a much more decentralized and democratic form of government governance where it is not the colonial shadow where of forests belonging to the state and then communities being on sufferance and allowed to occasionally enter the forest, um, you know, usually by bribing the forest guard and so on. But the Forest Rights Act of 2006 is a re really landmark piece of legislation because for the first time it acknowledges that under colonial rule, our forest dwelling communities faced a historical injustice. The injustice to seeing their land, their right over the forest land being taken away, the right to both use forests and also the right to manage their own forests in their own way. And these rights were taken away by the colonial governments and unfortunately not restored by the independent Indian government of 1947 till the 2000 Act, 2006 Act was passed. Uh, under this Act, forest dwelling communities have the right to make these decisions as a customary and democratic right. And effectively, this Act is propagating the principle that you and I also have rights in our own local environments to make similar decisions about our local environments, whether you're a ward, ward member of, or you're a citizen of a ward in Pune, or whether you're a citizen of a, a Gram Sabha in Garchiroli. You have rights over your environment, 
to take decisions about how it should be managed and what is to be prioritized. So if the Gram Sabha decides that they will prioritize carbon forestry and they will meet their uh, cooking needs through LPG, there will be a trade-off there which presumably somebody will catch. Otherwise, they will be selling, in a sense, uh, fake carbon certificates in the, in the market while they are consume, consuming LPG. But that is their choice. The choice that they should be allowed to make in, in the context of whatever uh, policies that exist. And since I'm in Pune and uh, we are talking about the state of Maharashtra, is actually at the forefront of recognizing community forest rights. And in Maharashtra, especially in eastern and the northern uh, boundary of Maharashtra with Madhya Pradesh, we have more than 5,000 villages which have received CFR rights under the Forest Rights Act. Some of them have received them way back in 2010, or starting 2010, many in 2012 and 2015. So that is, you know, top, almost 10 years ago that they have received these rights. And at least a thousand of those 5,000 villages are very actively using these rights both to improve their livelihoods by choosing how they will sell non-timber forest products. They will not go through the government uh, monopoly mechanism. They will do their own sales. They will manage the forest in their own way. They have now been supported by the tribal department that will come up with CFR management plans. So they are moving towards a much more bottom-up form of forest governance. And in that context, then, they are being approached by consultants and companies and NGOs to do carbon forestry without being told about all these implications, consequences, and numbers that are involved in taking semicultural decisions when we switch from firewood-oriented forestry, NTFP-oriented forestry, towards uh, carbon forestry, where then you will not be allowed to enter the forest or, or touch a tree because it is now sequestering carbon for somebody. Right. So our job, I think, as scientists is to make sure that the complete information, at the very least, is available to these communities when they take those decisions number one, and also to think a little bit more about what this carbon forestry business is all about. So if you switch the perspective from forest, the forest question, to the back to the climate question and say, um, why are we doing carbon forestry? Why are we encouraging carbon forestry? Why are we even considering carbon forestry? Why, why have we taken on this uh, commitment? The answer you will get from the West is because we are all sinking. We are all in the same boat. The boat is sinking, so everybody has to contribute something to bathing out the water from the which has entered the boat. And you have to do your bit. We will do our bit. And if you can do your bit through forestry, we will do our bit through something else, or we'll pay you to do that bit for us also. And that is the context in which this whole discussion about carbon forestry is happening. And that is the sustainability argument missing the justice part. It is simply focusing on the sinking boat, not who created the hole, who created the bigger hole, who continues to create the bigger holes and who is actually doing what in terms of their responsibility towards reducing their carbon footprint. So the standard argument that we get is some kind of a graph like this, which says, look, this is these are historic emissions on the left. And now the, if you just plot the business as a usual trajectory, this is how it's going to go. This is completely unsustainable. We will face havoc on the climate front. So we need to mitigate. We need to go down to below zero by 2050. And of course, of course, the biggest reduction has to happen in fossil fuel emissions. But anyway, you guys are, you know, not, I mean, the, the forest dwellers of India are not driving around in uh, whatever, you know, Mercedes or, or whatever the latest cars are. So they are not the biggest emitters of that fossil fuel. But you can contribute by doing this so-called nature-based climate solutions, the NCFs, which is that lower uh, slice. And you can do it for $5, $5 per ton of carbon or $10 per ton of carbon. So we are willing to offer you that much. Why don't you take that and, and do this uh, carbon sequestration? Uh, and from on this basis, then we see this proliferation of the term now, uh, eco-restoration, restoration, restoration nature-based climate solutions as the new packaging for the old term, which was basically carbon forestry or you know other kind of crazy terms like clean development mechanisms, REDD. So new jargon, the same, the, oops, the same idea that we will uh, we will do the carbon sequestration to save the world. If you look at this map, the so-called restoration potential, which is really basically carbon sequestration potential, this map claims that the potential is entirely in tropical and developing countries. Right? And that includes even Konkan, it includes the Himalayas, it includes all of central India, and of course, uh, you know, Thailand, Burma, Indonesia, and so on, Africa. Of course, you don't see any uh, uh, restoration potential in New York. 
You don't see any respiratory potential in London or in Paris or in uh, you know France, uh, any other parts of the global north. Is that because there are no uh, you know trees that could be planted there? No, because they've already converted everything into either agriculture or uh, urban habitats. So if you use your starting point as urban, what is already urbanized is to be removed. It is already converted to agriculture is to be removed, but somehow you're still seeing all of India portrayed as red, which means there is all agriculture in India can somehow still be converted into, uh, you know, uh, carbon forestry. So this is the kind of ridiculous stuff that is being spotted in, in terms of the idea of global restoration potential. So we have to ask the question, who are we restoring for? Who are we sequestering for? And carbon trading as a win-win solution. We are told that, well, you know, you don't have to worry. You will not get exploited because you will only participate in carbon forestry if the price is right which means the market will provide you the right kind of uh, incentive. If you do the calculations, today the price that is running in the so-called voluntary carbon trading market is about $10 per ton, and that's the kind of optimistic price. It also doesn't factor in the reality that in carbon forestry kind of solutions, more than half of the money goes to the intermediaries because the transaction costs in this kind of a solution are very, very high. Because if I promise to you that I will take your $10 and I will sequester one ton of carbon, you are in New York, I am in Garchiroli, and you have to be sure that I actually planted the tree, number one, that the tree grew at the rate that I said it will grow, number two, and that I did not cut, cut down the tree after taking your money. So which means for the rest of your life, somehow somebody has to be monitoring uh, this person in Garchiroli that they are not cutting down that tree or they are replanting if that tree, tree dies. Right? So the transaction costs of monitoring that I actually got my $10 of worth are $9. In which case, you really, the person at the end who's planting the tree is getting $1 or $2. That's the kind of transaction cost that is involved because you have this very high monitoring uh, issue. So even if you ignore that, at $10 per ton of carbon, if you plant 100 hectares and it grows at 3 tons per hectare, which is an optimistic number for natural regeneration uh, for 15 years, if you do really rapid growth, the kind of uh, money you will get for distributed over 100 households that are doing community forestry is going to be 2,400 rupees per household per, per year. Yeah. It's like four visits to the coffee shop in Pune, right? And few students from ISER over here must be <laughs> familiar with the <clears throat> coffee day prices. So that's the kind of that's the kind of ridiculous uh, promise we are making in the name of poverty elevation, saying it's a win-win. Yeah, of course, if the person is dying, then anything is a win-win. But is that the right way of looking at the problem? Is that the right way of looking at the problem? And just if you look at this one bit, was that if instead of the, the crazy Paris Agreement, which was a nationally determined commitments, every nation commits to whatever they want to commit to or they think they can commit to, if we actually had a fair global agreement in terms of who can emit how much, factoring in historical emissions, factoring in per capita calculations, and saying we have a remaining carbon space, which is X, and that needs to be fairly distributed across all individuals in this globe. And then you had a carbon uh, trading market. The price of carbon would have gone through the roof. Because then you would have an American whose average emission is 16 tons of CO2 per capita per year, needing to reduce to zero by 2050, not having the wherewithal to come down so dramatically, so, you know, uh, to the, uh, and so speedily. And therefore, desperately wanting to buy some credits from somewhere else, and they, then the price of carbon you should see. Prediction of 100 is probably at the lower end. So, without entering into any such agreement, without imposing the right kind of market, if you take up a pseudo market today, there is no real market because there is no pressure on anybody to do more, what more than they can. They are promising to do under the Paris Agreement. So there is no real pressure on anybody. And then they'll offer you some pittance, five ten, ten, five dollars, ten dollars in the so-called voluntary market because somebody is flying to a conference uh, in uh, London and saying, you know, I feel really guilty of flying, so I'll buy some credits on the voluntary carbon market. So then that's like five dollars per ton or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we really need to ask this question: Who are we sequestering for, and on what terms? Um, and therefore, this idea that it's a win-win solution is simply not tenable. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to end the talk by recalling Gandhiji's talisman, which was whenever you're in doubt or when self becomes too much uh, uh, with you, apply the following test. Recall the face of the poorest and the weakest man or woman whom you may have seen and ask yourself if the step you contemplate is going to be of any use to him or her. 
So this is really the question that we should be asking when we talk about forest carbon, uh, using uh, forest to sequester carbon. Is this going to be really useful to the forest, forest dweller who is still dependent on the forest, whose carbon footprint is 0.5 when you and I are at 3 or 5 or 7? Certainly as an urban elite, I'm probably at 7 tons of CO2 per capita per year. When the US is at 16 or 18, and that's only 16 or 18 because they outsource half of their emissions to China to do the production at the back end and so on. So in that context, what is the right thing to do to improve a lot of the uh, forest forest dweller? And I would like to add, add uh, uh, further qualifiers saying make sure that the rich are not taking advantage of this so-called win-win scheme that is being pushed down your throat saying, well, we don't really have a global agreement. But if we had, you know, then there would be a market and then I'll pay you five dollars per ton of carbon kind of uh, stuff. So I think it's really important for us to understand the forest problem or the forest situation in our country from this perspective of a very complex social ecology where also the most marginalized are the most forest dependent and who are going to be, have, who have been consistently left out of the decision making on forests. The forests have always been a site of contestation. This is not new. This uh, contestation, should we do carbon forestry? Give me your forest so that I can plant trees to get money from the US is not, not something new. They were taken over by the British for timber. They continue to be exploited for timber by the national uh, government. Uh, even today in Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh and parts of Maharashtra, we see coop felling rampantly going on in the name of scientific forestry. But on the other hand, they were then told that you cannot enter the forest because forest is meant for tigers. <laughs> And now forest is going to be uh, saved for carbon. And words like restoration and greening are just new terms for the same old story uh, where you impose certain kinds of trade-offs on local communities, on environmental beneficiaries downstream by planting fast-growing species. Um, what forest ecology first of all tells us that if you go by the natural regeneration route or use multi-species planting, you will have lower uh, uh, growth rates, lower sequestration rates. If you only focus on carbon, you will have significant trade-offs vis-a-vis other benefits of the forest. Social science warns us of the high consequences for the poorest amongst us who are the forest dwelling and forest dependent communities. And therefore, ethics warns us to not repeat the mistakes of colonial forestry uh, and not get recolonized by the global north to save them of the consequences of their own overconsumption. Thank you. Thank you. Like, I, for me, it's big learning. I would have also thought that trees are there to save us, save the carbon dioxide, like save us from carbon dioxide production. So the floor is all open for questions. If so you have questions to answer. <laughs> okay. I know this is. Not our area, but I'm sure there is a lot of questions sure. to ask. Him. Yes, uh, yeah. there are also questions coming up. Yeah, I actually want to switch a laptop. Yeah. <laughs> So are you ready to take questions? Yeah, yes, sir. What is that? Is something wrong? No, no, no. I'm just trying to put up something to be not quite related, but. Yeah. Uh, so, my question is related to like, we are seeing uh, the local communities as a monolith like in the talk that you gave, but the power imbalance in the local community itself drives those plantations that we are talking about. Uh, so the majority of the green cover that we see coming up is through those plantations in the Himalayas or the mountainous regions or even in Chhattisgarh or Odisha. So how do we deal with this power imbalance itself in the local communities? You're absolutely right. Uh, there is definitely a power imbalance everywhere. The global north-south is one form of one level of the imbalance uh, within the country, the power exercised by the forest bureaucracy or by you and me who live in urban areas and talk about saving the forest for tigers. The Avani story, which is very nicely portrayed in the movie also, Sherni, is also another form of power imbalance uh, where we are imposing our conservation needs or our conservation wants uh, 
on, on local communities. They face the consequences of tiger attacks. Uh, and there are power imbalances within local community, as you said. Therefore, our struggle has to be for democratization at all levels. The empowerment of the weakest, not just, as you said, not just characterizing the local community as homogeneous and somehow, uh, you know, proof to all the all the ills that we all struggle with. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lele, for uh, this nice thought provoking lecture. Uh, my question is actually as uh, business usual, you, we do nothing. I mean, the majority of the world do nothing actually. Then, who is you know, imposing this solution to the globe actually? I mean, there are few parties actually who are imposing this solution. Will they be more affected or who is most? Who will be more affected more actually because of the climate change? So you are touched upon a very important point that the uh, elite within the world, which is largely the global north, but also includes the north within the south, like us, we are in the top 10% of India's consumers. We are responsible for the largest uh, share of uh, CO2 emissions and therefore the climate change impacts. The consequences of climate change will not necessarily be the worst for us. Although this year India did face a heat wave of unprecedented proportions and everybody at, at some level was suffering. But even, even then when you look at a place like Delhi which went to a ridiculous uh, temperature of 47 degrees, who was suffering the most? It is the person who doesn't have an AC, doesn't per perhaps even have a fan, they have very little ways of, of solving that problem. Right? So they are the least responsible and the most affected. Now, <clears throat> in, in that context then, it is not anything that they do. They might plant a small poda in their jhopdi, but is that going to solve the climate problem? No. India could shut off its emissions today, just as a thought experiment, because our contribution is still, even to current emissions, it is 6%. So we could completely shut off our emissions and it would make not a difference to the process of climate change that is already ongoing. Right? So the biggest cutbacks have to come from the global north, but we have to also start thinking, not thinking about, we should have started long, long ago, thinking about the global north within our country. Because when we say we are at two and a half tons on average, you and me are above five or seven. And therefore, we are above the, the sustainability benchmark, even if we did a global calculation. So we need to start very quickly thinking about how we can change our lifestyle and not get sucked into the, the high emission lifestyle of the global north that we have been emulating for following for so long. Right? So I think we have, all of us have a lot we can do at our individual levels, but as this letter that we have tried to put out, if you can just switch off the lights for a second, uh, uh, also points out that it is a combination of individual action, but also collective action to change the institutions of decision making, the point that you made, which is that who's taking these decisions? Who's putting pressure on the Indian government to uh, agree to an MDC-3, which was very untenable on the one hand, because nobody else is willing to do anything. I mean. India and other countries in the global south felt like bending over backwards in Paris to make some really high commitments because they thought, okay, that way at least the others will follow and make some reasonable commitments. It's like, you know, you cut your nose in order, here in this case, cut your nose in order to appease the other guy. I'm not guilty, but I'm still cutting my nose, then at least you will come and do something more substantial, which has not happened. The US never, you know, Trump withdrew from the Paris uh, Accord. Now Biden says that they will come back, but the kind of commitments they have made are really pathetic anyway. Right? So I think we really need to work collectively at all levels, within our own country, internationally, as well as locally. Uh, so there are different kind of forests. So if, uh, the general assumption is like trees, the forest, but like what is the contribution of these different habitats, for example, the grasslands or how much contribution comes from this different so it's very funny actually the last biennial update report by the Indian government to uh, UNFCC claims that uh, we are otherwise sequestering carbon in our lands on the land use side we are a net sequester of carbon except in grasslands and I don't know where the science is coming from and one of the weaknesses in our system, as you know, is that we do not have a very good peer review process in the making of these government reports. It's been very opaque and it's become increasingly opaque over the last 10 to 15 years. That this, they claim that it's the grasslands which are net emitters of carbon dioxide. 
And the agricultural sector is a net sequesterer of carbon dioxide. That's the biggest sequesterer of carbon dioxide, according to government. Because apparently soil carbon keeps increasing with every crop. And I'm thinking like, because what we are doing in industry, especially in the industrial agriculture that is practiced in main, you know, mainstream areas like the Gangetic Plain and many parts of irrigated agriculture in Maharashtra, where you are using fertilizers constantly to uh, fertilize the soil, soil organic carbon is bound to re reduce, not increase. Where is the increase in organic carbon coming from? In every, after every crop, they are saying they are sequestering a net amount of carbon. So I think we have a real problem here, the, even the big science that we are doing, that we are putting out these kinds of numbers. So, yeah. And other things like, uh, like, I mean, as we know that uh, C is also great quantitative, especially in uh, the plants or even other organisms. In so is it also uh, a way we can do something there as well? Uh, not really. I mean, there have been some crazy ideas about promoting, I don't know, algal bloom in the sea and stuff like that. But, you know, the sea already, the moment you have an increase in atmospheric CO2, you will have through exchange, uh, you know, some amount uh, getting added back to the sea. So that is already happening. And that is why, in fact, if you look at the numbers in terms of fossil fuel related emissions over the last 150 years, if you just had emissions and all of that ending up in the atmosphere, you should have been far above what you are today. There's an unexplained gap that scientists have been working on, and it is explained partly through increased uptake in the oceans and increased uptake by the, uh, by forests. So that's the only explanation that we have so far. So seas are already doing a lot of it. But has it been? It has not been quantified. Right? No, it is quantified, but the the gap remains nevertheless. That in spite of what we know about the way the sea functions, the chemistry of the sea, the the, the chemical exchange, and then of course phytoplankton are actually doing uh, photosynthesis, right? So our photosynthesis estimates might be a little off. Those are harder ones than just the H2CO3, you know, dissolution balance uh, at the uh, the sea atmosphere uh, boundary, right? So uh, yeah, thank you for your very nice lecture. You presented a very uh, detailed analysis and probably first uh, completely different than what was projected in the media. So my question is like, uh, as we are rapidly losing the forest, probably we burn. Uh, so what is the way out? Like what what we can do to uh, like uh, balance it or to sequester more carbon? So I I uh, I'll go back to my point, which is that why do we care about forest? Whether whether now we care about it so supposedly for the carbon, but in general, why do we care about forest? So somebody says biodiversity, somebody says watershed benefits, somebody says local livelihoods, somebody says timber that we get from the forest. So there are multiple claimants on the forest, multiple claims and multiple claimants on the forest. But there are also the hidden claimants who want that land for something else. And historically, all of us are part of the process where from being forest dwellers, we moved into settled agriculture, which came at the cost of forests and grassland. All the agriculture that we have today in this country is by converting forests or grasslands into uh, agriculture, settled agriculture, right? So we are all, in a sense, deforesters. We are all here because of settled agriculture and built industrial society on top of that and urban society on top of that. You know, urban society would not exist in a hunting gathering uh, kind of phase, right? Because you're just collecting enough from the forest for your daily or two day kind of requirements. So uh, that's step point, one point to remember. So we are now feeling that we are outside the forest, now we want to save the forest. We have to remember that the forest also contributes disbenefits. The Shere movie is an example of the challenge of balancing the benefits and the disbenefits of the forest. Somebody actually faces tiger attacks, somebody's cattle is lost, somebody's sheep are gone, uh, elephants are trampling people and of course destroying crops in Karnataka on a daily basis. This is the reality. And that is what nature is. Nature is not this completely, you know, one-sided, benevolent uh, something out there. I mean, why are we sitting in an AC room? We didn't want the dhoop of uh, Pune even in a mild, uh, rain, rainy kind of weather, right? We didn't want to sit in the sunshine. So all human history for the last 5,000 years has been about this trying to balance between getting the good side of nature and keeping away the bad side of nature. So we're constantly fighting to control nature on the one hand and at the same time, obviously still dependent on it, right? So 
the forest question, I think we have to see in that context that forests are good for different people, also pro impose costs on some people. The opportunity cost of land is also, in, which is why you have now a Forest Conservation Act, which allows diversion of forests to mining, dams, highways. So the Ari Colony story in uh, Bombay is what? You mean forests are not important. When it is a matter of a bullet train, then forests are not important. So we have a genuine uh, debate there. And instead of saying, how do we save forests? We should ask the question, how do we make better decisions about forests? And better decisions by definition mean a better informed, but also better balanced in terms of the ethics. Not just my interest in forests, but as I said, I can go on a weekend to Nagarwadi to see the tiger. But the local person who is the most marginalized and is suffering the highest costs of the disbenefits of forests while also being dependent. Therefore, I think what we need is a more democratic forest government. So I can't give you an answer saying, how do we stop deforestation? I can say, how do we make forest the decision making much more democratic and informed? And if you can go in that direction, then I think we will see a better balance in terms of where the forests grow because they are of benefit to those communities. You are saying that the solution is more democratization. Is is uh, the trend or is, is are we going in that direction? No. <laughs> the short answer is no. We have a few. I mean, there is no one simple path that uh, political history or the history takes, right? So we have had a movement towards more democratization during a certain phase. We passed the Forest Rights Act. We passed the Panchayat Raj Extension to Federal Areas Act. We started with the 73rd Amendment, which was the Panchayat Raj Act themselves. So we were, there was a phase when we tried to increase the democratization in our country. We are now definitely in the regression phase. But the Forest Rights Act continues to be on the books. And so individual states have implemented and are implementing. Uh, now we have Maharashtra, Odisha, Chhattisgarh uh, at the forefront of this. Three very different states in terms of political dispensation or whatever, but all three implementing uh, the Forest Rights Act and supporting communities their own decision making. So, Are there any models in the world where such kind of uh, democratization has resulted in concrete uh, results? So uh, one thing I always want people that uh, as an environmentalist myself, when I entered the field of environment and for 30 years or maybe 25 years, I was also thinking like an environmentalist, which is to say I want good environmental outcomes, right? I want the world to be saved. I want whatever, you know, water scarcity to reduce or forest scarcity to reduce or uh, wildlife loss to be reduced and so on uh, as as the as my definition of a good society but given the amount of detail and the amount of locally specific tensions that exist between definitions of what is a good environment what is a good society what is development and so on uh, we have to think of democratic decision making as a goal in itself alongside all of this and therefore, there will be situations in which democratic decision making may not lead to some of these things. But that's not an evaluation of democratic decision making because we have to commit to itself as a good thing in and of itself. Just like when you try forest conservation, sometimes the tiger is going to hurt some people. That does not make the tiger conservation objective fundamentally wrong. Right? But tigers are hurting people even today. Elephants are hurting people today. Does that make elephant conservation as fundamentally wrong? No. But it may be, we may have taken some poor decisions in terms of the balance or the way we are doing it, the kind of uh, compensation we are paying and so on and so forth. Or the, the involvement of local communities in managing the forest where they would have been more alert to elephant presence and so on. So just like we don't say elephant conservation as an idea is bad because some people die because of trampling or... Similarly, we, we should not be saying democratic decision making is there as long as it gives me the the answers I want, and then bad if it is not giving me the answers I want. Because who am I to decide what are the right now? That's the tough, this is tough lesson for me in the last, say, 10, 15 years. So along with climate change, population explosion is also a problem. And with growing population, like the population of the world expected to grow globally, the carbon footprint is also set to increase. So what is the future of forests in that case? Um, so, uh, I think we should not be mixing uh, mixing outcomes with processes. Okay. So, population growth has been a process for a long time. 
it's not just something that started yesterday. It's been there for a long time, and the reasons for population growth are also complicated and multifarious. Uh, access to reproductive health care or the ability to control uh, the number of children we have is a very recent phenomenon in human history, right? It's a very recent phenomenon, barely 100 years old. And access to those technologies has certainly not been equal across the world. And it's not equal even today in this country. Even today, women are not necessarily having the right to decide what how many children they will have, even if they have access to the technology. So it's a social as well as a technological and an economic problem uh, triggered by colonialism, which left a whole section of the world in poverty, while the population growth of that other section of the world was uh, outsourced onto Australia and the US and so on, areas that were colonized by the exploding populations of the global north. So we need to understand these processes in their complexity. And at the end of the day, population growth is a process. And the problems that you're talking about could be climate change, they could be pollution, they could be uh, 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 lack of nutrition, malnutrition or food scarcity and so on. So if you look at the question of food scarcity in India today, we actually have enough food to feed all the people in this country. But we still have people with malnourishment and uh, you know even hunger deaths. So then is that a population problem? Right. So it's more a problem of distribution of the uh, food, which means lack of purchasing power for the poorest or the lack of service delivery of the PDS system and so on. So while population of growth obviously exacerbates certain parts of the problem, it also offers, uh, makes us think about why is it actually happening? Why, why are those outcomes really happening? It's not purely because of population growth or maybe not necessarily at all because of population. I mean, going back to the climate change problem, if the top 10% in the world are emitting 50% of today's CO2 emissions, then is this a population problem? Uh, I want to ask one question. There are a few questions okay, online. Sorry. I'll, I'll yeah, read them. Please. So uh, you mentioned that there was some change in the Forest Act in 2006, right? And certain, certain people, like certain regions, there were people given some right to take care of their own forest and also harvest, like, get things from them. Now, in, now that it has been up, up 16, 15, 16 years after that, has there been any quantification of forests in those regions versus forests which was only at, which is only under government? So, uh, uh, so actually, our, we are one of the research groups that are working on this question and trying to look at the change in those forests. Um, two things I wanted to sort of clarify. One is that although the act was passed in 2006, it came into effect in 2008. The first village to receive a community right was in 2009, which was the village of Mendaleka in Gadchiruli district of Maharashtra. The scaling up of this process happened only 2012-2015. So we are only talking about seven years since 2015, right? Uh, the active management started maybe even a few years later. Uh, and active management has tended to focus on how, if our forest has Tendupatta, We've been selling it to the government monopoly so far. <clears throat> if we sell it ourselves, will we make more money? So it has obviously focused more on the livelihood question, not necessarily on dramatically changing the management, except in areas where the forests were highly degraded to begin with. So virtually forest by and large are good, but if you go to, for example, Amravati, Regard side and, and so on, forests were already highly degraded. So, uh, exactly. So their efforts have been on regeneration. And you see regeneration where the government has cooperated with them, provided some investment to them. How do you regenerate a forest for five years when you're not getting any uh, livelihood benefit from it, right? Because there's nothing to produce uh, products. So in some villages where the government has invested a lot of money, Manrega money, so the employment guarantee scheme, or uh, forest departments, campa money, and other kinds of funds, you will see a, a dramatic difference. So if these people were not involved, it wouldn't have happened. In degraded forest areas, you will definitely need upfront government support. Along with local. I mean, local communities, because local communities tell you why the forest degraded. They said, Dengar Sarkar ka hai. Sarkar ka hai, to hum bhi kaatenge. So if the government is anyway doing cook felling and all that and selling the timber to uh, cities and uh, timber merchants, then hum ne kya gandhi kiya? Abhi hum to yaha pe rehte hai. We live here. We, we also have rights on the forest. We will also cut, and they said that we often had no other option but to cut and sell firewood in the local town. 
This is how many we got as number. We finished all the forest. Now we have nothing, but now we have the rights. So now we own the forest. We will regenerate. So if you do not own the forest, you have no way of telling somebody else not to enter the forest and follow your rules. We you make rules for yourself, but you have no way of enforcing those rules on others. So that the right is the right for management. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. That's crucial. That's great. So there are a few questions. Let's say one of them, Puneet says, I believe that one aspect of focus on forestry in international climate policy is also tied to the land questions, that is, who controls land. For example, to meet India's NDC through additional forest cover, we need more land. Do you have any observation on how the question of carbon forestry interest intersects with land rights? So I, I think it is rights of forest land. And I don't yeah, see yeah. them as separate. I think, Punita, uh, I would not see them as separate. Uh, it is rights over decision making on forest lands. And as I said, in the Indian context, now with the Forest Rights Act, in theory, decision making goes back to the communities and they will you know, hopefully make better balanced decisions between their own livelihood needs, conservation, and carbon. And, uh, you know, if there is an interest in incentivizing that through, you know, fair carbon markets, That'd be nice, but those carbon markets need to be fair and not creating, you know, where people sort of entice them and then walk away, which has happened in the past with Jetrova and so many other kind of, you know, so called again restoration or win win solutions to the problem. So if you have zero, then everything is a win. That's yeah. how they are that is how they are, you're projecting. Done. The win is really not a big win. Yeah. Uh, so the next question is what is an effective prescription to make the minority? that causes major damage accountable when the minority is unfortunately influencing global policies. That is uh, Selvaraj, Dr. Selvaraj from NCL. Yeah, I think that's a very fair and difficult question, which is that if the global north, which is the, whatever, you know, 20% of the world's population is consuming 80% of the resources and is the most powerful decision maker because they control the capital. So they control the capital, right? Um, and the markets and we are stuck in a situation where we think our only pathway for development is by producing for them, emulating China and becoming producers for them for the enjoyment of the global north. I think that is the real question. Can we, can we chalk out an autonomous pathway for development which therefore makes us, you know, our voice independent of their means and fancies and independent of their uh, uh, you know, reluctance to engage in these questions. It will require a remarkable uh, show of solidarity in the global south and a willingness to suffer. I think all of us are the beneficiaries of post-1991 liberalization. Whether it is our laptops or it is our cars or it is all the other stuff that gadgets that we buy from China. We haven't, we haven't really manufactured a whole lot of it in India, but we are, uh, except maybe Marathi Suzuki or whatever, but uh, we are the beneficiaries of liberalization. And the uh, and the uh, foreign exchange deficits are all our creation because that's where the, the majority of the stuff is being deployed. So how, are we willing to you know face a pinch and take a different path or develop? Is it both internally equitable and externally sufficiently strong that you have a voice which is not dependent on? We have to redefine the definition of development as well as literacy. But I think the uh, I mean in case of forest literacy. Probably what we call them in the trade on Absolutely. Absolutely. There's another question. Rajeshwari Raina. Because I signed this letter. Thank you for getting this done. One of my students asked me how this is different from climate colonization. And no, climate colonialism. As in the Stars book at all, kind of went of eco restoration potential you share. <laughs> we think like citizens of the world, how can we? So, I think our challenge here is to also educate the global north. Because the vast majority of even the educated people of the global north are clueless as to what is really going on. They do not even know their own carbon footprint. They do not even, in, in, they only know China is the biggest emitter. So that's what they've been brainwashed and hammered into by whether it was Bush or Trump or uh, uh, Biden, they will still use the same language. China is the biggest emitter, India is also a very big emitter. Why are they not making any commitments? Why are we only being asked to do this, that, and that? 
Nobody even knows their own. I mean, a very large fraction does not even know their per capita. That's a bad. Yeah. They never know what's. So, so I think you can begin with their registry. I'm not sure that's the end, but uh, in terms of trying to force a global citizenship uh, idea, how we can, how can we force that idea if people are so clueless as to where they are in the global kind of, uh, you know, taking order or, or overall context. One thing can be these meetings, like where India committed so much. Like there, there should be people very vocal and saying things, at least to be few people. I, th I think there. India's position in international climate negotiations has been, regardless of political dispensation internally, has been very consistent. And that I said the starting point was Rio 1992. And before that, the articulation of the idea of climate justice by Indian environmentalists who have been at the forefront of articulating that idea. And Anil Agarwal and Sunita Narayan's report called Global Warming in an Unequal World is a real path breaking contribution to that this whole discussion. That it is not about how much a country emits, it is about both the per capita, it is about historical emissions, it is about how you weigh methane versus CO2, and so on. It's really path breaking and it has brought the issue of justice and therefore a just sustainability to the forefront. But I mean, when powerful countries simply refuse because their interests are at stake or their so-called lifestyles are at stake, they have completely turned a deaf ear to the whole uh, argument. Like, uh, I think we can go on. This is completely like so much diverse field of not only climate it comes to, or not only forest, it comes to so many things. But uh, there, there is another meeting that in the boardroom. So maybe today we are going to stop here and anyone can write to you, right? Sure. And uh, ask any question if they want. And as a token of appreciation, we have just some small memento to share with you, which I'll request Ashish to present. What is but uh, the port is not <laughs> 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 Yeah, yes. it's all like everything you can leave behind if you're going to Delhi from here, right? So you can have Great, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. For the talk and for the Yes.